Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second lecture on Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Um, before I start this lecture, you should know a couple things. Number one, this is our last lecture of the semester. And in many respects, number two, I would suggest it might be our most significant or important lecture of the semester as we wrap up everything and specifically the play Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. We have used a feminist approach, feminism, cultural studies approach throughout the course as I've attempted to impart both different ways of looking at things from a literary critical perspective, but then utilizing one of those perspectives with each of our plays. Within this lecture, we're going to take an in-depth look at the play, as well as the 2012 production of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof at the University of Nebraska Omaha, which I directed as my MA thesis. You know I have two graduate degrees, one is an MA, one is an MFA. So this was for my very first graduate thesis. It's been pointed out to me by different individuals, whether they be other scholars or, or students, that this play lends itself to very strong opinions on both sides with hard-nosed logical and redeeming components that could be argued on either end. I think as we go through this lecture, you, you will come to understand what I mean by this, this quote when I talk about strong opinions on both sides, about hard-nosed logical and redeeming components that can be argued on either end. Th this, this quote, this phrase, really does sum up thoughts that I've had regarding student comments about the play uh, as I have discussed it over the years, uh, going back to when I wrote my thesis, as well as comments I, I've heard from other scholars. I do love this play. This play is extremely important to me. And, and not simply because I spent three years of my life researching it and preparing to direct it for for my thesis. As part of that research process, I traveled to New York and spent a significant amount of time at the New York Public Library for the performing arts and personally went through Burl Ives' archives. Burl Ives originated the role of Big Daddy on Broadway and later played the role of Big Daddy in the film version with Paul Newman and Elizabeth Taylor. And so I was able to go through his script, which had his handwritten notes. I read the telegrams that he and Tennessee Williams exchanged as they were uh, workshopping the play in various cities, specifically Philadelphia, prior to opening the play in New York City. And what I want you to know is that I bring all of that to the development of the love that I have for, for this play. It is a moment in time in the 1950s which I think is uh, not as centric to only that time, but the ambiguity within the play makes it suitable for us even today. And I hope throughout this lecture, as well as with your reading of it, you will come to understand why the ambiguity within the play is significant and important, but also why it can apply to today. Now, during the course of the semester, as I, I've said, we have used a feminist critical lens to analyze theater, to analyze theater's history, and, of course, the three plays that we've studied. One construct of feminism, 
which I believe is the most important with respect to this play specifically, requires an acceptance of everyone and an equality for everyone. So with this in mind, I am going to be playing devil's advocate to begin this lecture, specifically as we take a look at Brick. Brick is ambiguous for a reason. The ghosts that surround Brick, the haunting of Skipper, of the previous plantation owners, all factor into creating an ambiguity that ultimately manifests itself in Brick hiding his true feelings. And so he's ambiguous because of the ghosts. Uh, for him, primarily, it's, it's going to be Skipper. For his father, which he comes to understand, it's the two men that, that previously owned the plantation. And, and Brick is living in a time during McCarthyism, during the mid-1950s, during the Second Red Scare, where the idea and definition of masculinity is essentially coming under fire. And as such, he, ha he, he believes he has to hide his true feelings. Now, what's important to understand is that we are given a clue by Brick regarding what his true feelings are. And I'm going to talk about that shortly. However, no one, not you or myself, can truly state definitively, one way or the other, what Brick's true feelings are for Skipper other than what he says within a quote I'm going to, to discuss in a little bit. <clears throat> to attempt to say definitively one way or another that Brick is a closeted homosexual or that he is definitively straight would deny the ambiguity that surrounds this character. We don't know. We don't know what his sexual identity is. Tennessee Williams himself never conclusively stated that Brick is a homosexual male. I need you to understand that and to keep that in mind. So for you or for anyone to attempt to assert conclusively that he is would be to actually go against the playwright. I want you to think about that. Oftentimes when we are studying literature, whether it's in an English course or within this class when we have taken a look at art, specifically theatrical art, or if you were in a, a different art appreciation course looking at paintings and sculpture, one of the things we're asked to do is attempt to assign meaning. And in assigning meaning, we, in many respects, force our interpretations onto the art. In this instance, with this play, if we attempt to force an interpretation that definitively and conclusively suggests or states that Brick has a closeted homosexual tendency, then that would suggest we know more than the playwright. Because the playwright himself never never stated 
what brick sexuality is. So, in playing devil's advocate, we need to understand from a formalist perspective, the play never states that Brick is homosexual. But as many students and many scholars have suggested over the last 70 years, there are, of course, many clues. So here comes a question that you need to think about. Does feminism allow for the characterization of another person based solely on inferred clues. And I want you to understand here that you better know what the word inferred means. And if you don't, let me clarify that for you. To infer something means that you, yourself, are making a judgment about something else without definitive proof. So, does feminism allow for the characterization of another person based solely on inferred clues? Are you, am I, are we so sure of ourselves and so sure of our judgment that we can characterize brick or for that matter and this is what I think you need to keep in mind is important that we can judge the character of another person in our lives not based upon fact but based upon inferred clues based upon things we see, and so therefore we stereotype. Question number two. How should a person, and I want you to substitute yourself for this person, how should a person act if someone confesses their love or desire for that person, in other words, for you, and that person or you do not reciprocate that love or desire in the same manner, but instead you only feel this as friendship. Okay. Again, look at this from the perspective within the play. And I'm mixing critical perspectives here. I understand that when I say uh, the formalist idea. But I'm, I'm combining the formalist approach and the feminist approach here. If another person confess, confesses desires for you, or in this instance for Brick, and you, in this instance Brick, do not reciprocate those exact same desires. But you, or in this case, Brick, only feel friendship for that person. Well, how are you or Brick supposed to act? Think about that. How are you supposed to act if you do not reciprocate another individual's? feelings. Um, I, I, I think it's quite, quite interesting if you compare, for example, um, what most of us might think about in terms of contemporary American society, film, and television to another culture. For example, within Korean culture, and it's especially evident in Korean drama. The idea of a confession of one person to another is extremely important and is extremely significant. The, I, the act in, in that culture 
and within their drama of one person confessing, I like you, to another person is extremely significant and is generally followed by one of two situations. Either one, acceptance, which means that a relationship or a period of dating that potentially may lead towards a long-term relationship or marriage is about to be ensued, or non-acceptance, which means that those feelings are not reciprocated in the same way, and thus essentially functions as a refusal or denial. So, for example, in Korean drama, what you would see is when one person confesses that another person either accepts or politely says they cannot accept those feelings. So you have to look at this question. How should you act if what you only feel is friendship when the other person wants to feel something more, something deeper? And our third question, and this comes straight from Brick himself. This comes straight from the play. Brick says to Big Daddy, why can't exceptional friendship, real, real, deep, deep friendship between two men be respected as something clean and decent without being thought of as, and then this trails off. Brick does not complete the thought. He does not complete that, that quote. And I want you to take that question, and I want you to apply it to any two same-gender identity people. Is it not possible for exceptional friendship, real, real, deep, deep friendship, between two men be respected as something clean and decent without being thought of as something else. And for that matter, you could also potentially apply that question to any two non-same or opposite gendered identity people. Because there are, of course, cultures that look at opposite genders and suggest that real, real, deep, deep friendship is not possible between them either. So what is allowable for real, real, deep, deep friendship? If some cultures say that you cannot have it between opposite gendered identity people, for example, if I just take two potential or possible genders, male and female, and say that it's not possible for a man and a woman to have a real, real deep, deep friendship without a sexual connotation or, or relationship between them. Why isn't that possible? And then if we look at other cultures and they say that two men cannot have a real, real deep, deep friendship being respected as something clean and decent without there being something thought of as dirty sexual again, then what, what's left for us? We use this as a potential clue to suggest that Brick is a gay man. But if we extrapolate this to ourselves and to society and ultimately to, to a variety of different cultures, does this suggest that the concept of real, real, deep, deep, true friendship cannot exist in any way in a respected, clean, and decent manner for anyone? So, let's take a look at this play. And we're going to now take a look at it specifically with respect to the 2012 production. 
Cat on a Hot Tin Roof is the second Pulitzer Prize winning play that uh, Williams wrote. I directed it under the lens of a post-war existential philosophy. So I'm, I'm combining here ideas of history. I'm combining ideas of philosophy and looking at it. And post-war, I presume all of you know who we mean post-World War II. Freedom and angst, authenticity and inauthenticity confront each character internally and externally in their explorations throughout this play. Now, this semester, we studied plays from a feminism perspective. However, I directed this play in 2012 from a moral philosophical perspective within a historical setting. The play was produced by the University of Nebraska Omaha in February of 2012. This image, as well as the images you're going to see throughout the rest of this lecture, are production images from that play. This is the actress and the actor who played Maggie and Brick for me. And I will have credits naming them at the end of the lecture. So, to begin with, here is what the set looked like at the opening of Act 1. This is Maggie and Brick's bedroom. The theater space in which we worked was essentially a black box in which we could reconfigure it in any way we wanted to. And so ultimately, this became a type of a thrust stage with an audience on two sides. We had an audience here, an audience in front, I guess three sides, and an audience over here. This is the door from the hallway into the bedroom. This door represents the bathroom. We have the veranda, which extends, of course, beyond the, the walls of the bedroom. And over here on what was the stage left side, there were escape stairs. All three sets of doors open, but we use primarily this middle set. You see curtains hanging here. So we had a lot of shears. And these are rods. So when the audience walked in, these shears were actually closed all the way to this downstage point with the lighting inside so that you could get that sense of haunting. So as the play opens, Maggie, of course, has just re-entered. Her dress has been um, dirtied by Gooper and May's children. She's looking into the mirror. Brick has been in the shower. He comes out of the bathroom uh, with steam coming out. He's in his cast. And he is, you know, trying to begin to understand what Maggie's talking about as she's come in. Brick has not yet begun to drink. Keep in mind, he broke his ankle the night before on the track when he was drunk and attempting to hurdle. So he has sobered up as we begin this. And we continue this action between Maggie and Brick as she is changing out of one dress and is going to be choosing another dress. So as this back and forth between them continues, Maggie, of course, begins to really play off on her, her sexual desires for Brick as he laid across the bed and she attempts to, to join him. And she uses that sexuality. You see in the previous image, her heels were here. She's taken off the dress. She's just in the slip. Brick eventually lays on the bed. And what is a trope often used in film and theater, as the, the woman is in the slip, she has put her heels back on to attempt to join him on bed. Eventually, Brick puts on his new silk pajamas, which Maggie has for him, and he begins drinking. And she, however, has not yet put on her dress. Eventually, we know as Act 1 progresses, the nieces and nephews come in. Brick is drinking. Maggie is now dressed, and the children are running about. 
as act one moves towards its conclusion. So the children have invaded the space. One of the things to keep in mind within the play is that there are always people listening. And that goes to that idea of ghosts. That if we think there are ghosts around us, that they can observe our lives, then this is constantly happening in the play. Whether it's the five children running in and about, occupying the entirety of, of, of the space, and interfering almost with Maggie and Brick's lives, or other characters functioning in that ghost archetype, listening and being aware of what's going on. So as act two then begins, the party for Big Daddy's birthday outside has now transferred into their room. And so let me identify the characters here. Of course, you know, we have Brick with his crutch. We have his liquor and he drinks a lot of it throughout the play. We have Maggie, we have Big Daddy, we have Big Mama. We have Gooper. Now, let me explain something with respect to Gooper. In casting, there are different ideas about how do we incorporate diversity. At one point in time, there was a concept that was called colorblind casting. Uh, there is now what we typically talk about in terms of casting within theater and film and television, color conscious casting. Here's the difference. Colorblind casting suggests that we do not look at the ethnicity of the characters. We do not look at the ethnicity uh, of the actors. We pay no attention to any of this. We cast. Specifically, this is applied to Caucasian roles. It would not be applied to non-Caucasian roles. If you have a non-Caucasian role, you definitely need to have uh, color conscious casting. But when, a, <clears throat> when applied to Caucasian roles, the concept of colorblind casting was uh, very prevalent. Uh, color conscious casting suggests that each role is being specifically cast according to an ethnicity, a background, um, or color to create a diversity within the cast without using any specific type of terminology. The professors within the department asked me what I intended to do with the casting. And I told them that regardless of role, I simply wanted to put the best actors on stage in every role. Raydell Cordell III was the absolute best actor for the role of Gooper. And I cast him. Regardless of the fact that he was an African American and that we are doing the Southern play. Likewise, uh, within this play, it, it's often thought that the servants would be played by minority actors. The university did not have a high population of minorities, uh, specifically within our theater department. And one of the things I personally wanted to do was not cast minorities in the servant roles. And so, uh, ultimately, the servant role, which is not depicted in this image, was not cast as a minority. I did receive criticism, not from within the department, but from outside critics over what they saw was perplexing, where they themselves could not get beyond the idea that the best actor was cast in the role, but instead an African-American was cast in the role. So let that sink in for you a little bit. Here we have Reverend Baugh. He is, of course, holding his Bible, so you see that posturing. And then, uh, or excuse me, 
Reverend Tooker, and then Dr. Bach. I, I uh, mixed up the titles and the, and the names. As Act 2 continues to progress, we see Big Mama attempting to overwhelm Brick with her affections. And again, this idea of haunting comes in because here we have Maggie, and you can see the outline of Gooper in the background in shadows listening in. What I want you now to do is to take your script and take a look at the stage directions that Williams wrote on page 116. This is in Act 2, and Williams writes, Brick's detachment is at last broken through. His heart is accelerated, his forehead sweat beaded, his breath becomes more rapid, and his voice hoarse. The thing they're discussing, timidly, and painfully on the side of Big Daddy, fiercely, violently on Brick's side, is the inadmissible thing that Skipper died to disavow between them. The fact that if it existed, it had to be disavowed to keep face in the world they lived in may be at the heart of the mendacity that Brick drinks to kill his disgust with. It may be the root of his collapse. Or maybe it is only a single manifestation of it, not even the most important. The bird that I hope to catch in the net of this play is not the solution of one man's psychological problem. I'm trying to catch the true quality of experience of, in a group of people that cloudy, flickering, Evanescent, fiercely charged interplay of live human beings in the thundercloud of a common crisis. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some mystery should be left in the revelation of character in the play, just as a great deal of mystery is always left in the revelation of character in life, even in one's own character to himself. This does not absolve the playwright of his duty to observe and probe as clearly and deeply as he legitimately can, but it should steer him away from pat conclusions, facile definitions, which make the play just a play, not a snare for the truth of human experience. The following scene should be played with great concentration, with most of the power leashed but palpable in what is left unspoken. And so then Brick continues. Who else's suggestion is it? Is it yours? How many others thought that Skipper and I were? Playwrights rarely write stage directions. When you read a play and there are stage directions, typically what has happened is that the first time that that play was professionally produced, the stage directions that the stage manager put down that the director gave while directing it have been incorporated into the script. And that typically ends up becoming the end all be all for how that play should be acted out. So unless there's something specific in action that a playwright truly wants to see occur, only then do they put in stage directions. So it's even more rare for a playwright to put in a stage direction that is complete and total commentary. And he is essentially telling us, okay, here's one way to look at it, but here's the other way. And to suggest one is more correct than the other would be wrong. But what is right is for us to probe looking at these characters and apply it to our real life experience to attempt to understand there's two sides to every coin. As the play progresses, and we get to Act 3, I've told you previously that in the 
1974 revision that Williams wrote, Big Daddy is now in Act 3. In fact, he's all the way up until the conclusion. In the 1955 version, that is not the situation. And so, these two images show Maggie telling Big Daddy that she is pregnant with Rick's child. And Big Daddy picking her up off the floor, putting his hands on her womb and saying, yes, yes, you are. And Brick not knowing what to think. And so now I want you to go to page 171. And at 171, we're going to take a look at the ending. And specifically, we're going to look at the dialogue that begins after May slams the door. She, May has just said, liar. She slams the door. Marga exhales with relief and moves a little unsteadily to catch hold of Brick's arm. And Margaret says, thank you for keeping still. Brick. Okay, Maggie. Margaret. It was gallant of you to save my face. He now pours down three shots in quick succession and stands waiting, silent. All at once, he turns with a smile and says, There. You can see that moment happening. Margaret says, What? The click. And we get William's directions. His gratitude seems almost infinite as he hobbles out in the gallery with the drink. We hear his crutch as he swings out of sight. Then at some distance he begins singing to himself a peaceful song. Margaret holds the big pillow forlornly as if it were her only companion for a few moments, then throws it on the bed. She rushes to the liquor cabinet, gathers all the bottles in her arms, turns about undecidedly, then turn, runs out of the room with them, leaving the door ajar on the dim yellow hall. Brick is heard hobbling back along the gallery, singing his peaceful song. He comes back in, sees the pillow on the bed, laughs lightly, sadly, and picks it up. He has it under his arm as Margaret returns to the room. Margaret softly shuts the door and leans against it, smiling softly at Brick. Keep in mind that while they have been sharing the room, they have not been sharing a bed. His pillow was on that chaise lounge that was downstage that he sat on. If you think about that in the beginning. And so here, we see them confronting each other across the bed with his pillow firmly on it. And Margaret says, Brick, I used to think you were stronger than me and I didn't want to be overpowered by you. But now, since you've taken to liquor, you know what? I guess it's bad. But now I'm stronger than you and I can love you more truly. Don't move that pillow. I'll move it right back if you do, Brick. She turns out all the lights. I really have been to a doctor. And I know what to do. And, and Brick, this is my time to conceive. Yes, I understand, Maggie. But how are you going to conceive a child by a man in love with his liquor? By locking up his liquor and making him satisfy my desire before I unlock it. Is that what you've done, Maggie? Look and see. That cabinet's mighty empty compared to before. Well, I'll be a son of a... He reaches for his crutch, but she beats him to it and rushes out on the gallery, hurls the crutch over the rail and comes back in. Anton. And so tonight, we're going to make the lie true. And when that's done, I'll bring the liquor back here and we'll get drunk together. Here, tonight, 
in this place, place that death has come into. What do you say? I don't say anything. I guess there's nothing to say. Oh, you weak people. You weak, beautiful people who give up with such grace. What you want is someone to take hold of you. And so at this point, I had Maggie begin calling across the bed, take off his pajama top and take hold of him. Gently, gently, with love, hand your life back to you like something gold you let go of. I do love you, Rick. I do. <clears throat> and the last words of the play, Rick says, wouldn't it be funny if it were true? And the lights dim. <clears throat> Excuse me. On them. To eventually fading completely out and coming back up to the empty set. And so here was the production team in the cast. Maggie was played by Erica DeBoer and Brick by Nick LeMay. Uh, Gooper, of course, by Radel Cordell III. And so now, what I want to do during these last few minutes of this lecture is take a look at the philosophical and psychological constructs of these characters as we go through and look at the costume plot that Sharon Sobel um, designed. Keep in mind in this previous page, I also list my assistant director, Josh Ryan, who was fantastic. He was in charge of, of the five children and every scene that involved the children he directed, my stage managers, assistant stage managers, and then all of the um, designers. The time period, it's 1955 in the play, but I, I would suggest that it, you could apply this play to almost any time period since then. It's caught up in the middle of McCarthyism. It's fraught with social and cultural accusations of disloyalty, subversion, and even treason. Uh, Social and cultural accusations of disloyalty, subversion, and even treason. We currently live in cancel culture. You have to see that this play is even appropriate for now. Each of these ideas represents an un-American construct of society that had to be identified, had to be uprooted, and had to be branded for corporeal punishment. Yet within this time frame, Williams created a scorching, character-driven, ambitious, and ambiguous theatrical experience. The underpinning of potential themes resonating throughout the play include, of course, misogyny, secretive, latent homosexuality, and greed. And these three are clearly at odds with the time period. I think you can see that these three also play a factor in our current existence in the 21st century. While they might not necessarily be completely at odds with, with our current experience, these issues are very prevalent and are very much issues that we want to stamp out within this current society. I hope you see why I, I view this play as significant and important. So the, let's talk a little bit about this. We have a blistering nature for Maggie the cat. She has a presence that I've told you in the last lecture. Uh, exudes sexuality and ambition. It dominates the amb ambiguity of her husband's brick. Inconclusive sexual desires. If you don't agree with me by now, 
that there are inconclusive sexual desires with Brick, I would say you haven't been paying attention. You have been attempting to force your own conclusions onto the character. You I, I, I hope you completely agree it's inconclusive. The profanity that exudes from Big Daddy within the play demonstrates that he's lived. Big Mama, of course, can be characterized as shrill and a well-meaning mother. And as I said in the last lecture, these are intense characters battling each other as feverishly as the American government fought to cleanse the country during the second Red Scare, the embittered battle against unpatriotic members of society. I think that this last sentence, you should think about not only the 1950s, but you could think about how that could be applied historically and artistically to every decade, including this one, since this play was written. So let's start. Psychologically, Maggie is defined through Young's persona of actions. Okay, Young's persona defines Maggie through action. She creates a physical appearance and studies herself to appear appealing to other men, all in an effort to try and get Brick's attention, capitalizing on Brick's passive and aggressive attitudes towards her. Okay, this was the sketch for um, her first dress. This was a... a um, influence on that first dress and inspiration and we see the slip that was designed and built and ultimately the inspiration for that that maggie wears this is the sketch of the final dress that was then built including the jewelry for maggie now let's take a look at brick brick represents a ubiquitous character example of Sartre's existentialism. Brick's perception of the facts of the world and his consciousness of those facts, that's that phrase I gave you in the first lecture, a phenomenological ontology, results in a flawed and cloudy conclusion. The one thing we can note for certain is that Brick suffers from guilt. Big Daddy has or makes use of leering looks and verbalization of his longing for a woman like Maggie. And this completes Young's shadow imagery. So whereas Maggie was dealing with Young's exploration and definition of actions, Young's shadow imagery applies to Big Daddy. Sartre's existentialism applies to Brick. The confrontation that occurs between Brick and Big Daddy clearly displays the conflict between a world of perception of an individual, his actions and relationships, and the individual's perception of the self. Okay, think about this. What we have going on, especially in Act 2 between Brick and Big Daddy, that conflict represents the conflict between the world perception of the individual, the individual and his relationships, and the individual's perception of himself. Okay? Um, this cashmere robe was, of course, designed and built for the play. Big Mama is on a different level. This dress also was designed and built. Despite Big Daddy's disdain for her, which should be evident in the play, she has this unwavering enthusiasm for him. She is a fully subjugated woman to her man. Equality between woman and man 
is not inherent, but is resulting in a sexual struggle. Big Mama is a subjugated woman. May, however, casts a shadow over the inferior Gooper, as far as she is concerned. May completely and totally defines her existence upon her ability to bear children to the Pollock family while attempting to deprive Brick of his inheritance and attempting to further Gooper's importance to Big Daddy. Those are the two most important things May thinks she can do. She can bear children so she can have babies and she can make Gooper look more important to Big Daddy, which ultimately should get her and her children a bigger, if not complete, share of the inheritance. In the play, I had five children play the roles, which meant that May in her 30s was expecting number six. Gooper, however, functions as a pawn for May's stability completely and totally due to his ineptness with courting his parents' appreciations. Neither parent appreciates him. He's unable to gain the favor of either Big Daddy or Big Mama, and it is through Gooper that May attempts to define herself. He is often an overshadowed character. He attempts to instill family stability and strength, but he lacks a moral backbone. Reverend Tooker is a supporting character that then completes the background. His presence illustrates that someone's always around, is always listening, and often is in the way of the action of the main characters. He is supposed to be familial support for the revelation about Big Daddy's health. He is a reverend. Symbolically, because he's a reverend, he represents the moral compass of the play. His profession suggests that there is a moral dilemma, whether it be with Brick or the truth concealed from Big Daddy. He represents the morality that is stagnant and in the way of this family functioning. And so he and his profession are significant. Dr. Ba, then, is another supporting character that completes the background. His presence illustrates that someone, again, is always around, always listening, always in the way of the action of the main characters. But as a doctor, he represents truth, specifically the medical truth that is being kept secret. Suki, then, um, is the only servant I ended up casting. And you need to keep in mind, designers design prior to casting. Suki, as this additional character, is supposed to complete this imagery of the Old South. The idea that there are always servants present, like Reverend Tooker and Dr. Baugh. She's in the background. She gets in the way of the, the main characters. She is a servant. She is a representative of the past. That representation shows that the family itself cannot move on from their past lives. This servant represents a past history in an effort to complete the play's imagery. Lacey is a character within the play, much like Suki, completing that imagery of the Old South. He's in the background. The family's not able to move. Ultimately, I did not cast this role. I did not think the role was important enough that we had enough with the other supporting characters. And so Lacey's dialogue was blended in with Suki's. And so, with that, this brings us to the conclusion of our second lecture on Cat on the Hot Tin Roof. This is the entire cast. Uh, of the play. Uh, Josh was my assistant director. Liz was my stage manager. Mo, an assistant stage manager. Um, and then we have my other assistant stage manager. We have May, five children. 
Uh, I hope that this gives you a clearer, defined perspective with respect to the play cat on a hot tin roof, and that you are able to look at it not just within the time period in which it's set, but can apply that to perspectives today as well in an attempt to understand our current existence, but also understand what ultimately might be important, that when things are ambiguous, when art is ambiguous, that's okay because it causes us to think. But the one thing ambiguity probably should not cause us to do is to force conclusions. I'll leave you with that final thought. Take care, everyone.